I'm Phil Buchanan, I'm president of CEP. My colleagues are Ellie Buto and Kevin Boldick. Many of you know them. Um, and as we've heard, what we're talking about today is, and tomorrow, is leading effective foundations. And um, I, I do believe, while I completely agree with Grant, uh, that it's a lot easier uh, than holding down three part-time jobs, uh, it is a uniquely challenging role. I do think there'd probably be some eye rolling if I said that to a crowd of grantees, um, and I get that. Um, but I've talked to a lot of you and you say, you know, it's kind of unsettling actually uh, when you go from whatever role you had before to being a foundation president. When you go from hearing critique and criticism to what feels like being surrounded by adoring masses. And um, that's actually really not helpful, right? Um, you know that it makes the job tougher if you don't really hear uh, feedback. If you do the job the way you want to do it, to maximize the resources for which you're responsible, then you need critique, you need feedback. And you also have, in a way that I think maybe leaders of other institutions don't, and this is particularly true for private foundations, maybe a little less true for community foundations, um, kind of this unbelievable freedom to make different choices, different decisions, and to try to figure out what is best for your very different uh, context. It can be almost overwhelming, and it feels like there's an ever-increasing torrent of advice about what you should do, uh, offered as often the new silver bullet. Influence policy. Influence policy. It's the only way you're really going to make an impact and create systems change. Don't influence policy. It's totally anti-democratic and inappropriate for a foundation to do that. Provide general operating support. How could you not give grantees the kind of flexible core support that they so desperately need? Don't provide general operating support. It's completely irresponsible not to understand how your resources have been used. Act like a business, like a philanthro-capitalist or a philanthropreneur or some other made-up word. <laughs> Don't do that, because it doesn't make any sense. And, and what business, anyway? Anyway, you get my point, I think, because you're living it. There's a lot of choices to make. There is, as uh, Faye Tversky pointed out, uh, in the report that she wrote, uh, and she talked about this at the closing plenary of our last conference, a lot for foundations to juggle, foundation leaders to juggle. She talked about CEOs, but it's true for VPs for program, others in leadership roles, it's true for board members. A lot of choices. So what we're gonna try to do in this plenary, it's gonna be a little bit different, is get you thinking about the, some choices in a few areas where we have some data that we think could prompt or provoke you. Um, so we're going to focus on three topics, we're going to give you a little data, we're going to ask you to discuss. Uh, then we're going to come back and move on to the next one. And um, all of this is work that Ellie and her team have done and then she lets Kevin and I share in actually uh, telling, you, uh, telling you what we learned, which is very generous of her. So the three areas uh, that we're going to talk about are investing practices and how they do or don't align with mission and programmatic goals. So we'll look at the state of practice today uh, based on a new just released report from us that's out today and that's on your tables. Then we'll turn uh, to the disconnect. Ellie will talk about the disconnect uh, between intended beneficiaries and foundations, at least as perceived by grantees, the nonprofit perspective on that disconnect, and also the nonprofit perspective on what feels to grantees like a disconnect between the interest in performance assessment and the willingness to support their efforts to assess. And that's based on two recently released reports uh, drawing on our grantee panel uh, that we survey from time to time. And then finally, Kevin is going to talk about some soon to be published analysis that isn't out there yet, um, looking at the connection between what happens inside the foundation walls and how that ripples outside. All right, so I'm actually going to 
start and talk about investing practices. And there's been a lot of talk about this issue, aligning investing and mission. And that's not a new thing. I mean, there's a long, long history in terms of this issue, uh, generally and also with foundations. But I think you would probably agree that there has been a mushrooming of, of, of interest in recent, um, in recent years. So these are three books that have almost the same title, but they're all different uh, uh, by folks talking about um, impact investing. And, 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 and that's about seeking a social return alongside a financial return. And then another investing practice that I want to talk about is um, making sure that you're avoiding investments that might conflict with mission, program, uh, programmatic goals, or, or values. So uh, it's getting a lot of attention on college campuses right now in terms of divestment from fossil fuels, but this issue has a long history, div divestment from tobacco companies, or in my day, back when I was in college, it was divestment from companies doing business in apartheid South Africa. Uh, so we wanted to gather data on foundation practice in both of these areas, um, impact investing and negative screening. So we did that as part of a larger operational benchmarking uh, study that was supported by the Bechtel Foundation, covering a range of topics. Um, for the questions that we're drawing on today, uh, in terms of the investing data, uh, Mission Investors Exchange helped us to develop the items, which we really appreciated, and actually co-sponsored the survey. But the analysis is, is ours that I'm describing. So we surveyed foundations, uh, private foundations, CEOs of private foundations making $10 million in grants or more. Uh, we had 64 respondents, and I'll talk about that data. We hope to develop similar data for community foundations in the future. So let me start with impact investing. What's going on? And when I talk about impact investing, I'm talking about it as the global impact investing network defines it. Investments made into companies, organizations, and funds with the intention to generate social and environmental impact alongside a financial return. In the survey, we included mission investments and program-related investments as a couple of examples that might fit within that definition. And what we see is interesting is a lot of the large private foundations from whom we gather data are, are doing impact investing. So 41% um, say that they're doing it today. Another 6% plan to. A third are unsure. And only 20% said no, and you know, it's really not on the table. We're, we have no plans to do impact investing. So, a lot of foundations are doing it. It looks like a fair number may get into it. But how much are foundations really allocating to impact investing? Uh, that was our next question. And the numbers there remain small. I might even say uh, really, really small. Uh, so it, when we asked about if you're making impact investments out of the endowment, what percent is allocated to impact investing? It was just 2%. For those making impact investments out of the program budget, and of course some are, are drawing from both sources, but for those making investments out of the program budget, just a half percent, just a few hundred thousand dollars at the median foundation. So I think it's fair to say that the story of impact investing for the large private foundations for whom we gathered data is a story actually of widespread but very small scale experimentation, not significant investment. But what about the other issue? What about avoiding endowment investments that might run counter to mission values or programmatic goals? Last year, uh, in the fall, Rockefeller, the Rockefeller Brothers Fund got a lot of attention for divesting from fossil fuels. And we were curious, like, are they an outlier, or are others doing this, both for this industry, but for many others? Um, and so we crafted a survey item asking whether you're screening anything out, long list of options, place to rate other in case we didn't think of some industry that you would want to avoid. But what we saw is that the 
overwhelming number of large foundations have no negative screens whatsoever on any industry to exclude uh, different companies or organizations from their investment portfolio. Of the 17% who do, most are excluding tobacco companies. And actually, only three respondents had divested from fossil fuels. Now, this could be changing. It could be that the RBF's decision has prompted a lot of conversation in boardrooms. We were asking about the practice today. But it does seem that the overwhelming number of foundation CEOs and boards at the large private foundations we'd surveyed feel that the endowment should be invested to maximize returns, unfettered by any screens, whether to screen out tobacco, tobacco fossil fuels, for-profit prisons, gambling, or any of the long list of industries we asked about. So in the recent weeks, many who we talked about these findings with said, look, that's not maybe surprising. It's the fiduciary responsibility of foundation boards to maximize returns. And our data suggests that that, that, is, that is how fiduciary responsibility is interpreted um, by the overwhelming number of foundation boards. So we asked the CEO to describe uh, how the board interprets fiduciary responsibility. 82% said focus on financial return. Only 18% said you know, it's got anything to do with social or environmental impact. And the CEO said they agreed. They, they agreed with the board's interpretation of fiduciary responsibility. So perhaps that's why the dollars allocated to impact investing remain small and the screens few and far between. So I'm not here advocating, I'm just reporting the data. Um, and, and I have really been struck by how um, passionately held and divergent the views are on these topics. So some see impact investing as a very important tool, uh, a, a way to pursue goals different from grant making, something that foundations should, should really be jumping into. Others see it as pointless, that the market will find uh, on its own the things that make sense, uh, or even that it's a kind of idealization of what is possible to achieve uh, through market mechanisms. Similar kind of polarization on the issue of negative screens. Some say, look, it is absolutely crucial that we make sure that we're not doing things on the endowment side that conflict with goals on the programmatic side. It's about substance, but it's also about symbolism, and it's really important. Others say, give me a break. It's never going to matter. It won't make a difference and it diminishes the resources we have to pursue our programmatic goals. So I think there's lots to discuss and debate, and we wanted to get you involved in that conversation. So what we're gonna do now is ask you at your table to, well, maybe first introduce yourselves, if you haven't, uh, and then spend about 15 minutes uh, answering these three questions. Do you engage in impact investing in negative screening? Why or why not? get thinking about this, talking, learning from colleagues. Um, we're not gonna report out, because I think that would be hard, but you can tweet out uh, from your table. You just don't wanna out anybody, right, in your tweet. Uh, make sure they're comfortable with whatever you're tweeting. But um, hashtag CEP2015. So I'm gonna give you 15 minutes, and at about 13 minutes, I'm gonna try to get you to kinda close out and focus your attention back up here, and we'll move on to the next topic. All right, take it away. There is a session on this topic. Uh, tomorrow, uh, if you want to, if you want to pursue it further, I know 15 minutes isn't a long time. Uh, again, feel free to tweet out uh, whatever the headline is from your table, uh, as long as it's nice. Hashtag CEP 2015. Um, so I want to move us on to the next uh, discussion. Ellie's going to talk about the nonprofit perspective, uh, how grantees see foundations. And again, she's going to draw on two uh, recently released publications from CEP based on surveys of our grantee panel. Ellie Buteau. Hi, everyone. So Phil talked about investing as one way that foundations can pursue their programmatic goals and mission. 
Uh, one key way at most foundations, though, for pursuing programmatic goals and mission is still through grant making. When it comes to the issues that foundations are trying to affect through their grant making, there's some cause for concern, at least from the nonprofit perspective. Because nonprofits don't believe that most of their foundation funders are in touch enough with the needs of those that they're trying to help. In our research, the majority of nonprofit leaders say that most of their foundation funders do not have a deep understanding of beneficiaries' needs, nor do they have a deep understanding of the causes of those needs. The majority of nonprofit leaders also find that most of their foundation funders do not have funding priorities or programmatic strategies that reflect a deep understanding of beneficiaries' needs. And on the one hand, it might seem easy to discount the nonprofit perspective here. Nonprofits are closer to the ground. They should have a deeper understanding of beneficiaries than foundations should. When we shared these findings with foundations, we heard a variety of reactions, including that one. Some told us foundations don't need to have a deep understanding of beneficiaries' needs. That's for nonprofits to figure out. But how then do foundations figure out the right goals to pursue? or the most effective strategies to pursue those goals? How do they select the strongest grant proposals? The results can be problematic when funders don't have a deep enough understanding of needs. We've seen what happens when philanthropic dollars are targeted in ways that are well-meaning, but don't address the true needs of beneficiaries and instead, instead address what funders think the needs are. I am sure many of you have read the articles about what happened in New Jersey with the well-intentioned donation from Mark Zuckerberg, the hope that was created, and the reality of how things turned out, at least so far. The nonprofit perspective on funders' understanding of beneficiaries is not entirely negative, though. In our research, nonprofits could clearly identify characteristics of those funders that they believe have a deeper understanding of beneficiaries' needs. They say those funders actively engage with their grantees, approach their work with a sense of humility, openness, and partnership, and have a connection to or knowledge about the issues that are facing beneficiaries. As one grantee in our research wrote, some funders seem to come into the relationship thinking they know more than we do. Funders do probably spend more time reading academic literature, but they don't spend time with low-income people. While they have much to teach us, we also have much to teach them, and the best funders realize that. In addition to nonprofits finding foundations to be out of touch with the needs that, of those they're trying to help, nonprofits also find themselves trying to assess their progress on tough issues with little help, or support from their funders. There's often talk in the way that nonprofits are discussed inside and outside the sector that nonprofits don't really know what they're doing. They're not interested in being rigorous in assessing and improving their performance, and in fact, they lack the ability to do that well. We've heard some of these same concerns from foundation leaders in our research. Many foundation leaders say that grantees' inability to understand their progress is a barrier for foundations to be able to understand their own progress. And while three quarters of foundations in our research tell us they do support nonprofits' efforts to assess performance, more than two thirds of nonprofit leaders tell us they're not receiving any support, monetary or otherwise, from foundations for these efforts. Twice now, we've surveyed nonprofits representative of grantees of larger foundations and found that nonprofits say they do prioritize performance assessment. 99% of nonprofit leaders in our most recent survey, less than a year ago, say their organization is collecting data to assess its performance and many want to do an even better job at this. These results were met with great skepticism by some foundation leaders. Skepticism and disbelief that nonprofits are truly trying to understand their performance. 
And while from our research we can't make any conclusions about the quality of the efforts that nonprofits are putting forth, we do have some examples of the types of information that nonprofits say they find most helpful in these efforts. Examples include collecting data before and after people have participated in a program or training, tracking whether legislation has passed or policies have been adopted, and conducting satisfaction surveys with clients or customers. Nancy Sudi, who's the Director of Research Evaluation and Strategic Learning at Colorado Trust, reflected on CEP's blog about how much she really knows about what the Foundation's grantees are doing to assess their performance. Nancy wrote, not once do I remember asking grantees what kinds of information they collect to understand their performance. Never did we ask them about their capacity to collect data meaningful to them. Rather, we usually approached grantees with our questions and provided resources to collect data for our answers. Nancy mentions wondering about the capacity of nonprofits to do this work on their own. In our research, we see that nonprofits are spending a very small percent of their budget on this work. At the median, it's just 2%. And very few nonprofits have any staff dedicated to thinking about these issues. Most nonprofits are using the information they collect to improve their programs or services or to inform their strategy, which is great. And while nonprofits say they are using the information they collect to communicate externally with donors or with the public about what they've achieved, there are some missed opportunities that we see in the data. For example, only a minority, 41% of nonprofit leaders say that they share with other organizations what they've learned about what does and does not work. When asked, almost two thirds of nonprofit leaders in our research could name at least one foundation that had been helpful to their organization's efforts to assess its performance. And about a year ago, we added some items to our grantee perception report to collect more data on the helpfulness of foundations on this issue. Based on that data, we do see some foundations that nonprofits find particularly helpful in these efforts. We highlighted two of them in a research report we released last month, the Mary Reynolds Babcock Foundation and the Assisi Foundation of Memphis. And when we ask Gladys Washington, the program director at the Mary Reynolds Babcock Foundation, what she thought needed to happen in order for nonprofits and foundations to make progress on this issue together, she said, we need to focus on how we think of metrics more holistically, how we think of progress more holistically. And we have to do that with our nonprofit partners at the table. So now at your tables, we're going to ask you to reflect with your colleagues on the choices you make at your foundations. We'd like you to take about 15 minutes to discuss these two questions. How your foundation seeks to better understand the true needs of its beneficiaries and how it supports grantees' efforts to assess their performance. Thank you. Um, now we're going to turn to our next topic, though, and Kevin is going to share some data about how what happens inside doesn't necessarily stay inside. Uh, Kevin Boldick. Thanks, Phil. We've been talking at CEP now for well over a decade about the importance of the people who staff foundations, all of you, the cultures you build, the values that drive your work, the practices that shape how you work with your grantees. In fact, those elements make up a core piece of CEP's definition of what it takes for a foundation to be effective. We are by no means the first people to focus uh, on this topic. For example, Alan Pfeiffer, past president of the Carnegie Corporation of, the, of New York, wrote eloquently, frequently, about this exact to topic. In talking about foundation effectiveness, he always put what he called the human element first. Because after all, even if people talk about foundations or their effectiveness in abstract terms, in fact, they're referring to the characteristics of the people in foundations, their behaviors, the culture that they've created. So maybe it's not all that surprising then that as uh, I talk to foundations, or we talk to foundations, about 
uh, grantee surveys, they frequently ask about internal culture and staffing. We get asked whether we truly believe that there's a connection between what's happening inside a foundation and grantees' experiences working with foundations. It's a question raised often in wondering whether the distinctive pieces of a foundation's culture, the good, the bad, the idiosyncrasies, whether those things translate out to grantees and others. It's a question raised in the discussions of trade-offs about what the right level of investment is for a foundation to make in itself, in its staff, in its operations, in its culture. You guys are a little slow on the uptake on this one. <laughs> At CEP, we also sometimes find anecdotal evidence for that internal-external connection. Uh, when grantees make that link explicitly in their comments about a funder as part of a grantee perception report. Here's an example paraphrased from a recent comment that we highlighted in a GPR. This grantee wrote, the foundation itself should better reflect the mindset and philosophy of change that it's advocating for. I highly doubt that rigid, high pressure, hierarchical thinking is what the foundation is trying to promote, but it is what the staff are providing. And of course, we see the opposite, and we see the opposite much more frequently. Foundations who internally, whose staff top to bottom feel aligned and empowered and motivated. Foundations whose grantees view those staff with incredible respect and admiration. As this grantee wrote, this is the best foundation we've ever worked with. They're so much more than a charitable foundation. Their staff have at various times been our counselors, our encouragers, our advisors, our inspiration. They truly care. It's tempting to rely on these anecdotal comments and assume that the internal external connection must exist, but we wanted to go beyond anecdote and gut instinct. And we've now worked with about 50 foundations on surveys of staff and 250 foundations on surveys of grantees. And we've reached a point where roughly 29 of them have contemporaneously received feedback from both staff and grantees, allowing us to give a more rigorous answer to the question about this internal-external connection. So does it exist in the data? Simply, yeah, it does. The data show a clear and statistically meaningful relationship between staff perceptions and experiences and their grantees' perceptions and experiences. So in what areas? I think they're interesting. Foundation expertise matters a lot. Those foundations whose staff believe that they more strongly understand the fields and communities in which they work, well, they have grantees who tend to rate more positively for the impact those foundations are creating. The foundation's culture of learning and improvement matters. The more strongly staff inside a foundation agree that the foundation itself learns from its past experiences when designing new programs, well, interestingly, their grantees rate the quality of the relationship they have with the foundation more positively. And finally, staff engagement and culture matters. We see connections between staff responses about their own empowerment within their foundation and grantees' perceptions that the foundation has communicated clearly and consistently to them. So the hypothesis seems valid, right? That better internal dynamics are associated with stronger work with grantees. In other words, the people that staff foundations and the choices that they make, that all of you make, matter. The way staff work together and the group culture you build matters. The influence of those things is felt by your grantees. And so by extension, the consistency of those elements matters as well. And that can be a challenge at some foundations. Some years ago, Phil, Ellie, and I wrote an article for the Stanford Social Innovation Review on exactly this topic. It was about the ways in which variation in grantee experience is strongly related to which program officer they were working with inside a foundation. We'd seen that on several key survey themes, statistically more of the variation in grantees' ratings could be explained by their answers to the question, who was your program officer, than could be explained by their answer to the question of which foundation had funded them. We've repeated that analysis over the years as our data set has grown, and the pattern absolutely still holds true. Particularly on questions related to the funder-grantee relationship, who a grantee's program officer is really matters. Program officers are inextricably linked to effectiveness and aspects of responsiveness, approachability, and clarity. 
Here's an example of how we see this play out at some foundations. We're about to look at an example of grantee perception report ratings of clarity of communication of goals and strategy. This is a fictional example, but the data is very much based on several recent GPR users. At the average, foundations' results can look very much like their peers, about a five and a half on a one to seven scale in this particular measure. But peeling down a layer, the results to the, level, to the level of results of individual program officers, we sometimes see wide variation in ratings, even, even among program officers working in the same program area. I think the implication is pretty immediately apparent. To improve clarity overall, a foundation like this would need to work with its individual program officers, learning from exemplars, coaching those who are struggling to communicate goals and strategies clearly to grantees. Now this pattern of, of, of variation shows up in other aspects of the grantee survey as well. The extent to which grantees find the application process helpful in strengthening their own work, that's closely tied to which program officer they're working with in a foundation. Likewise, the amount of helpful non-monetary assistance that grantees receive, that too is strongly associated with who a grantee's program officer is. Now, this variation is not necessarily a performance issue. It could be a reflection of different grantee needs. It could be a reflection of different strategies program officers are using to uh, reach their goals and the foundation goals. But like it is for many foundations we work with, this kind of variation can be concerning. Uh, and it's certainly worth conversation and attention. In the Artful Juggler piece that Phil mentioned earlier, the CEOs that Faye interviewed, looking backwards, tended to say that they believed they had underinvested their time and energy in creating a healthy organization. Internal dynamics can be better or worse. Foundations can have more or less consistency. Even as you all are pulled in a hundred different directions outside the foundation, it's up to you and your colleagues together to cultivate and maintain the great internal dynamics that this data shows us is associated with better work externally. What happens inside your walls, your internal practices, your behaviors, the culture that you build and lead, it ripples out to your grantees in really meaningful ways. And that's where we'd like to turn you now. So again, at your tables, we'd ask you to take about 15 minutes and discuss your answers to this question. How do you believe the internal dynamics at your foundation connect to your external work? Thank you. So, look, as some of our opening welcome speakers uh, made very clear, the um, challenges are big. And we're, my, we're reminded every day how big the challenges are. Um, the challenges are glo global, they're domestic, they're local, they're right outside these doors. They're all around us. And I think we believe that foundations are uniquely positioned to take on the toughest challenges. And sometimes, sometimes with good strategy and the right conditions, change happens in ways that inspires and even surprises us. So a decade ago, um, we held CEP's third ever conference here in San Francisco. Our dinner speaker was a mayor who had made national headlines by issuing marriage licenses to gay and lesbian couples. A year later, in research we were conducting on foundation strategy, we came across the Gill Foundation in Denver, which along with Haas Jr. here in San Francisco and many others, were working hard and very strategically to advance rights for gays and lesbians. Gill, actually, we were so struck by their approach, they became our exemplar in our foundation strategy research, which we presented at our 2007 conference, sharing a video of the foundation's then executive di director describing the foundation's evolution, and it was an evolution, it almost always is, to being a very focused, strategic, and data-driven foundation. Today, as you all know, marriage equality is a reality in a majority of states, and maybe soon nationally. Yeah. 
and, and so there is progress, that's my point, it's possible, it's possible. We see progress, um, often supported by foundations in other areas too, change and progress. We had a board member at CEP um, who every meeting, a number of years back, every meeting about two hours in, he would ask the same question. He would say, effectiveness for what? He wanted to bring it back, I think, to why it matters. It's not about effectiveness for its own sake, he would say. He was worried, I think, about a technocratic approach that might become disconnected from the ground, from, from the importance of why, why you all do this work, why we at CEP try to help foundations to be more effective. So he would remind us every meeting, about two hours in, and he would say, for a country in which opportunity, education, and health doesn't depend on zip codes or the color of your skin, for a world in which freedom and access to food and water are universal, for economies in, work, in which working full-time does not mean living in poverty, for an earth that's sustainable, for a world in which there's more understanding, more peace, less extremism. Effectiveness for what? It's for that. It's about effectiveness for that, for these issues and many others. Your work matters. I hope the next two days offer you the opportunity to consider how to do it yet better, yet more effectively. Thank you and have a great time at the conference. <laughs>